Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. This one is an entitled People Pro Revenge Story. I've lived in my house for over 20 years and absolutely love the property. The best part is the 150-year-old oak tree in the backyard that provides ample shade. I used to play on its sturdy branches as a kid. And now my own children do the same. That tree is easily worth $150,000. Not just in monetary value, but sentimental value, too. A few years ago, a homeowner's association, homeowner association, formed in our neighborhood. I didn't join since they seemed intent on controlling everything. The homeowner association president, Karen, pestered me to sign up, touting the supposed benefits. But I valued my independence. One day I returned from work to a shocking sight. My precious oak tree had been cut down. The backyard looked bare and empty. I saw a work crew starting to pave over the area. Marching over, I demanded an explanation. They said the homeowner association had authorized turning my yard into a parking lot for the neighborhood. I was absolutely livid. This was my private property. I told the workers to stop immediately and called Karen. She nonchalantly said the parking lot would increase my property value. I told her she had no right and to stay off my land. Karen laughed, saying that according to homeowner association bylaws, they could utilize 15% of non-members' land. I pointed out I never agreed to their bylaws since I wasn't a member. Karen smirked, saying it didn't matter. The homeowner association could do whatever they wanted. I decided to get legal advice and contacted a lawyer. She reviewed the homeowner association bylaws and confirmed they had zero authority over my property. She helped me file a lawsuit against the homeowner association for destruction of property and trespassing. In court, Karen appeared smug assuming the homeowner association's influence would sway the verdict. My lawyer presented documentation proving I owned the tree and never granted permission to remove it. An arborist testified that the oak tree was worth $150,000 based on size, age, and health. Karen scrambled to justify their actions, claiming the homeowner association's parking lot plan was approved by a majority vote. My lawyer objected stating the homeowner association had no jurisdiction over my private property regardless of any vote. The judge agreed and ordered the homeowner association to pay me $150,000 for the value of the destroyed tree. He also charged them with trespassing and unauthorized destruction of property. Karen protested angrily, but the verdict was final. I had won. The homeowner association tried to threaten me into dropping the charges, saying they'd make my life difficult. I refused to back down and warned I'd report them for harassment and retaliation. Fed up with their bullying, many neighbors disbanded the homeowner association entirely. Karen even had to move away once people found out how crooked she was. Justice was served at last. With the $150,000 settlement, I planted a new oak tree on the spot the old one stood. It comforts me to see it grow, a reminder that persistence and truth can overcome greed and deception. My kids now play under its expanding branches, unaware of the drama that preceded its planting. I'm just glad I got to rebuild that little piece of our happy home. If you enjoyed the story, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. The next one is Pro Revenge Story. I'd been working at Wilson & Sons for nearly a decade. It was a small business, just ten of us on staff, but it felt like family. Mr. Wilson treated us well, giving bonuses and extra paid time off whenever he could. I was grateful for the job having started right out of high school with no real skills to speak of. Over time, I worked my way up to a leadership role and felt like I had a future there. When the manager position opened up, I decided to apply. I didn't have a degree, but I had the most experience at Wilson & Sons, besides Mr. Wilson himself. Unfortunately, he ended up hiring someone else, someone with a business degree. I was disappointed but realized if I wanted to advance any further in my career, I would need more education. So I made the difficult decision to leave Wilson & Sons. Mr. Wilson understood and wished me well. I enrolled in the local university financed by scholarships and grants. To pay my living expenses, I took a part-time job at a retail store called Murphy's. Murphy's was a bigger operation than I was used to, with around 50 employees. There was high turnover, so new faces came and went all the time. I started working in the warehouse, answering to the warehouse manager. Over the next several years, I finished my business degree while continuing to work at Murphy's, eventually moving into a full-time position, and then becoming the warehouse manager myself. Around that time, we hired a new clerk named Jenny. She was friendly and a hard worker. We got along well. Then Amanda was hired. 
She started as a cashier, but had ambitions far beyond that role. She brown-nosed her way up the ranks, eventually landing a prominent sales job. Amanda made it clear she didn't like me. We butted heads constantly at work. She was a chronic complainer and tattletale, yet accused me of being a snitch any time I reported issues about her behavior. Amanda badmouthed me to the other employees and blamed me for things that weren't my fault. But she never took responsibility for her own actions. One day, a valuable ring set arrived at the warehouse, a special order for a client worth over $5,000. I followed the proper jewelry handling protocol, ensuring the pieces were secured and documented. The last step was to transfer them to the main office safe. When I brought the rings to the office, Amanda was the only one around with the safe combination. She was busy writing an email and told me to just leave the ring box on her desk. She would put it away shortly. Given the friction between us, I didn't feel like sticking around. So I left them with her and went back to the warehouse, trusting she would secure them properly. The next morning I was called into the office by the store manager, Mr. Murphy. Amanda and an HR rep were also present. Mr. Murphy informed me the ring set was missing. Amanda claimed she had checked inside the empty box I gave her. I maintained I had verified the rings were in the box before handing it off. With no surveillance footage to corroborate either story, it turned into a matter of he said, she said. Amanda insisted it must have been my fault since I was the last one handling the rings. I had no way to prove I'd done my due diligence. Based on Amanda's version of events, Mr. Murphy made the decision to fire me for the loss. I was escorted out, shocked at the accusation, but powerless to refute it. Unemployed and with a mark on my record, I felt hopeless about finding another job. On a whim, I decided to call Mr. Wilson at my old workplace, Wilson & Sons. I explained to him what had happened at Murphy's, asking if I could use him as a reference. To my surprise, Mr. Wilson not only agreed to serve as a reference, but offered me a job. The manager role I had applied for years ago was open once again, and Mr. Wilson wanted me to fill it. I gratefully accepted. While getting settled back in at Wilson & Sons, I finally learned what had really happened with those missing rings. Jenny, my old warehouse clerk from Murphy's, had orchestrated an intricate plan to expose Amanda's lies. Over the next year, Jenny pretended to become friends with Amanda. She gained her trust and often commiserated over my firing. One night, when drinking at Amanda's place, Jenny subtly brought up the ring incident. Thinking Jenny was on her side, a drunk Amanda openly bragged about stealing the rings herself to frame me. Somehow, Jenny's husband had recorded Amanda's admission on his phone. They took the evidence to Mr. Murphy, who swiftly fired Amanda and got the police involved. A search of her home uncovered the stolen rings in her possession. Thanks to Jenny's ingenious scheme, Amanda was arrested for theft. I was asked to testify at her trial, which I did gladly, happy to see justice served. In the end, Amanda got off easy with just a few years in prison. Jenny's quick thinking and loyalty had saved me. The cherry on top? Years later, who should apply for a job at Wilson & Sons but Amanda herself? I conducting her interview myself and simply said, I don't think you're a good fit for our company. Have a nice day. The look on her face was priceless. The next one is, am I the a-hole story? I woke up this morning to the sound of shouting and splashing coming from my backyard. I rushed to the window to see what was going on and couldn't believe my eyes. My neighbor's kids were jumping on their trampoline and chucking oranges from their tree into my pool. There had to be at least a dozen oranges bobbing around in the water. I felt my blood start to boil. Those little rascals had some nerve messing up my pool like that. This was the last straw after months of those kids blasting music, leaving trash in my yard, and generally being a nuisance ever since they moved in next door last year. As the oldest kid grabbed another orange preparing for his next shot, I lost it. Hey! I bellowed out the window. Cut that out right now before I call your parents! The kids shrieked and scrambled off the trampoline, the little one bursting into tears. A minute later, the kid's mom, Julie, came marching over. Just what do you think you're doing yelling at my kids like that, Mia? She demanded. I explained what I had seen them doing and how they had been causing problems for months. They destroyed my pool and could have broken a window or hurt someone, I said. I'm sorry I yelled, but they need to learn boundaries. Julie got right up in my face. Who do you think you are disciplining my children? That's my job, not yours, she snapped. They've been cooped up all summer thanks to the pandemic, and we're just blowing off some steam. I took a deep breath and tried to remain calm. I understand this has been a tough year, I said evenly. 
but that does not excuse them damaging my property and putting people in danger. If it happens again, I will have to get the authorities involved. Julie scowled at me and stomped back to her house without another word. I surveyed the damage to my pool and sighed. I had a feeling this was only the beginning of what would be a long and frustrating battle with my neighbor. But I was not about to back down and let her kids run wild. If setting boundaries made me an a-hole in her eyes, then so be it. I knew I was in the right here. Comments for the story. Comment one, not the a-hole. Those kids were clearly out of line messing up your pool like that. While cabin fever is real right now, it doesn't excuse damaging someone else's property. You had every right to yell at them to stop. Their mom also needs to teach them to respect other people's belongings. She can't expect others to just tolerate them acting up. Good on you for standing up for yourself. Hopefully they learned their lesson. Comment 2. You are the a-hole. Did you really need to yell at those little kids so harshly that you made one cry? They're just bored kids looking for entertainment during a pandemic. A better approach would have been to kindly ask them to stop and explain why. If that didn't work, then you could have spoken to their parents. Screaming profanities at children should always be an absolute last resort. You owe them an apology. Comment 3. Everyone sucks here. The kids shouldn't have been using your pool as a fruit basket, but yelling at them. So aggressively probably wasn't necessary. Their mom also shouldn't have dismissed the situation so readily and should discipline her kids better. At the same time, this sounds like there's some background tension between you two families. A more productive solution would have been for both of you to have a reasonable discussion about boundaries and expectations. Getting the authorities involved seems premature when a basic neighborly chat could solve the problem. You all need to learn to handle conflicts in a mature manner. Update. I wanted to give an update on the situation with my neighbor's kids damaging my pool. After Julie chewed me out for yelling at them, I decided to take a day to cool off before trying to resolve things. The next day, I went over to Julie's house with a plate of cookies and apologized for losing my temper. I explained that I valued being on good terms with neighbors, but that her kids' behavior had become an ongoing issue that we needed to address. Julie sighed and said the pandemic had been hard on the kids being cooped up. She apologized for not intervening sooner and admitted she had noticed them acting out more. We had a productive discussion about expectations, with me emphasizing that I understood kids will be kids but didn't want them unsupervised in my yard anymore. Julie agreed to talk to her kids and said she would start taking away privileges if they kept causing problems. I'm hopeful that will be enough, but made clear that if issues continued, I would have to take formal action. The next day, her kids came over to apologize for the pool incident. I thanked them and said I knew it had been a tough summer. The little one gave me a handmade card saying sorry, which I thought was very sweet. While Julie and I got off on the wrong foot, I'm optimistic we can be cordial neighbors moving forward. The kids have been much better behaved since our talk. I'm relieved we could resolve this without getting authorities involved over what was mainly bored kids looking for entertainment. Being the new neighbor on the block isn't easy, but I'm committed to making it work. The next one is an entitled people story. For context, my 28-week pregnant sister-in-law, Sophia, and her husband, my brother, moved to the state I live in two months ago for his work. They relocated from a different state, which was also where her parents lived. Thus, this is all very new for her. Furthermore, she is currently unemployed and staying at home, so she feels rather lonely. My husband, wanting to make them feel more welcome and comfortable, suggested planning a small welcome party for them, which I thought was a good idea. We celebrated at a restaurant because her apartment was not yet fully furnished, and my house is a mess. We have a one-year-old son, and we are moving to another city soon. So we have boxes stacked all over the place. Sophia is aware of that. Recently, however, Sophia has been constantly talking about having someone throw her a baby shower because she saw a TikTok about it. She has become incredibly fixated on this. At that point in time, we were approximately a week away from the move. Our furniture had been wrapped and our house was mostly empty. My husband was busy finalizing the arrangements for our move, so I was mainly the one taking care of our son. Sophia would often call at night when I was bathing my son and putting him to bed to complain that her parents couldn't come down to see her, and her husband was disinterested in baby showers. She would tell me she wished someone would surprise her with one, heavily implying that I should do so since I was the only person she knew in the state. I reminded her that I was in the middle of a move, and explained that she could consider hosting a baby shower and I would try to attend after everything was settled. She said it's just not the same. The final straw was when my baby was vomiting and running a high fever. She decided to send me a Pinterest board about baby showers. 
I showed it to my husband, and he was upset, so he texted Sophia that I'm not obliged to throw her any kind of party and then blocked her. After the move, I unblocked her, and she started messaging me that she's hurt and upset by my apathy. Then she asked if I'm angry because she didn't help with the move. Her final message was that I'm acting like wanting to celebrate her baby is too much to ask for. And if you could host a welcome party, I don't understand why you can't do a baby shower. I'm ignoring her because I will not put up with her nonsense any longer. But God forbid I march over to her apartment and knock some sense into her. Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.